Testing. 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 Is there something happening? I'm testing one, two, three. Good. Back. Come closer. <laughs> or go farther. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jason. Um, <clears throat> so I'll tell some stories of, of all the difficulties that, that come when trying to work with, with um, people in developing countries to, to make wheelchairs. When we first started way back in 1980, um, working in Nicaragua, there was virtually no wheelchair industry in 80% of the world, in the 80% of the world that didn't have the money. And the technology in the West here was not very good at all. I started riding a chair in 66 when I was a college student. I slipped on a motorcycle, tumbled, broke my back um, at the T2 level. and uh, and. The first chair I, I bought for the equivalent in today's dollars of about $2,500 lasted half a block. Hit a crack in the sidewalk in Chicago, where the sidewalks are pretty rough, and bam, stopped hard, tipped forward, almost threw me out. I was lucky that I m managed to catch an armrest and not land flat on my face. Um, but then when I tried to recover and get moving again, I couldn't get the chair to roll. The front wheel had been, the fork had been bent back, the bearings had been broken, the swivel bearings on the, and, uh, and the caster barrel, that, that the swivel housing that, that connects the caster fork to the, to the side of the chair was bent backwards, its weld had cracked. And I took it to the to the back to the manufacturer and said, "Hey, what is this? You know, I've been riding bicycles over railroad tracks for 18 years, and and uh, why would this happen just like that? It only maybe what three miles an hour." And uh, they said, "Oh, we're so sorry, we're so sorry, but 
yes, it's broken, it's beyond repair, we can't really fix it, but we'll give you another just like it for free. Uh, that one, of course, didn't last long either, though I, got, uh, though I stretched its life off and swapped parts between them um, for the next couple of years until I finally retired them for my first homemade chair. At that time, uh, one of those two commercial chairs, very expensive commercial chairs, was fractured in 20 locations on its frame. Or, or uh, let me say, it would have been. It had fractured either in, either in unique places, like the middle of the X brace, or it had fractured in parts that, of which there are duplicates. So, the, so if it had broken on the left side where it had broken on the right side, that would have been 20 fractures in the frame. And uh, by then, I knew my local welder very well. He had taught me a few tricks as, as to how to analyze failure and how to, how to predict yield and how to predict fatigue fracture and, uh, and how to weld, which I needed. And, and I, was, I was off to the races building my own chairs. First one was a stair climber, built it in 67. And uh, it was great for visiting my girlfriend on the third floor of the dormitory. It also bro broke down a lot. It was electric powered, two, two automobile batteries and a couple of um, surplus motors. It was, it was low. My seat was only three inches off the ground. And it, would, I could, it was like riding a go-kart, basically, down on the ground. And I could go backwards upstairs with it. When I got where it was going, I could zoop, lift it up to regular height. Um, it was a lot of fun. And it was also very obedient. obedient. Um, it would fail on, on, on command. And so when I got to the third floor and visiting hours were over in the girls' dorm, it would break down and take all night to fix it. <laughs> Um, so I went looking for other wheelchair inventors all around the U.S. And the, the industry at the time was controlled by virtually a monopoly. It had been for, for 20 years at that time, almost 20 years. And uh, I found very, very little, a little in the sports area, but even sports chairs were controlled. That company sponsored most of the sporting events and said, you have to ride our chair, this particular chair or you're not allowed to enter. Had to be the same one that had failed me in half a block. Still, still, still can remember that clearly. And I was, I was so disappointed in that industry when I saw how, how it had failed, how, how poorly it was designed. Um, classic example of monopoly. For 20 years, that monopoly had allowed the prices to, had pushed the prices up and had allowed the, the quality to slip downward, had made shortcuts in the design of their chair, making it much, much weaker. Simple things like, like that, you couldn't do on that chair. You, could, you would begin the failure process of that front fork, running into a, into a curb, trying to climb a curb, but hitting it. That, that would have destroyed that chair. And and yet, very, very little was happening in the development of new chairs. People were spending their time just fighting with that manufacturer over the failures, the unnecessary fa failures they saw, and trying to find ways to pay for their next one. Um, and so eventually, I, I started looking elsewhere. I went to Mexico. I went to Nicaragua. And there I found lots of people who had received again, similar chairs to mine, but they had gone through the 20 plus failures, worked with their local blacksmiths, and uh, figured out why they failed and made them so they wouldn't fail again. Of course, they were heavier, they were, they were beefed up, but um, for a 50 pound chair, they were damn good after, after a bunch of work. Here's an example, this one is in India. This is a chair that was patented in the 1920s but built in the 1980s. Um, and, um, and very similar to others I would see around the world. Look at that front caster. That's a commercial caster off an industrial cart. Very, very heavy. And whoops. Um, th 
But the connection to the caster to the frame in this case was far weaker than the caster itself. That extended tube is just welded on one side. All the way around the weld, those tend to crack. And, and uh, yep. This lady had this chair, solid tires, not pneumatics. Pneumatics, as we know from bicycles, roll much, much better. Of course, they're more of a repair problem. But over years, they're less of a repair problem because you can buy replacements for bicycle tires in any part of the world. You cannot buy that tire in India except at the factory. Custom made. Here's what happens to the majority of Western chairs that get given away in the US, in Europe, in Japan, sent south. Um, within a year, they've got all kinds of things happening to, happening to them. Again, and we need good chairs in this country, right? We've, and, and chairs have changed in this country since the monopoly was broken in about 1980 and 79. Um, Chairs have changed in this country, at least top of the line chairs, for two to five thousand dollars. You can buy a chair that'll stand up. It's actually engineered, and 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 fun to ride by comparison. Um, but that, chairs with those kind of prices are not going to make their way south. Uh, so, so. But at that time, again, this is all we had in the U.S. Even we we, we dealt with our chairs with great care. And I found more expertise for fixing our chairs outside of this country, in Nicaragua in particular, and eventually in Africa and Asia. Um, and that's, so that's where I ended up in 1980 in Nicaragua, um, starting to work with disabled folks there who, who were already reinforcing, fixing their own chairs. And they wanted to build more. They wanted to build them better than anything that was coming into the country. Here's a fellow in India with his locally made chair. Again, the design is, is pretty, pretty cumbersome. But at least the chair was tough, very tough. And he had made hundreds more for people on his southern India marketplace. Well, I, this is behind a hospital in, in Uganda. Um, and that's where most of the imported chairs, chairs land. They're, they're really only good for spare parts, and those spare parts aren't very, aren't very uh, strong or adequate. There are good tricycles all around the world. In India and China, there are more tricycles than there are wheelchairs. And they're far, far more efficient for rolling outdoors. Of course, they're not very useful in the bathroom or the workshop or the kitchen. but house to house, they're nice transportation. They're generally ridden by people with lower levels of disability than people who need wheelchairs. People who maybe can walk a bit or scoot on the ground without, without a wheelchair can move around once they get to the house or, or the factory where they work. This is Zambia. Here's India. Notice the difference between these two. This one has a, a base frame. Um, square tubing, one inch squared tubing or, or metric equivalent, 25 millimeter. This one is all round tubing and it's a single tube only on one side. Easy, much easier to get in and out. Well, actually no, this one's a low floor. They're both easy to get in and out of. Some of these have, some of these have frames that block your legs on one side. This one though is lighter, simpler, a much more, I would say, elegant design. Um, and, uh, and, and it has a springiness to it. Actually, the whole, the whole frame flexes a bit and gives it a, a nicer ride over, over rough ground. So given the limitations of, of tricycles, I was mostly interested in getting, getting help from people in developing countries to make my chairs better, and not to work on tricycles so much. They, they, their designs had in some ways leveled off, at least in some countries. And so this is the first chair we finished in Nicaragua in 1980. Um, this is the woman who s sewed the fabric and taught us all how to sew fabric. We taught her how to weld. She was a, um, 
member of a three-person group that, that still functioning has made now thousands of wheelchairs. Again, our first chair, notice it, we went from a box frame to a, to a triangular frame. We, we stole the good idea of bicycles of the, of the 1800s and um, made, a, made a stiffer, stronger frame with less weight and less cost by going from box to, to triangle, two triangles, one on each side. And it's kind of rough looking. It was very, they called it rustico, um, painted with spray cans and, or a brush and a, brush and a, and a regular can of enamel, um, but strong. Every part of this chair had been tested one way or another. We, we figured out that it would be strong enough. Some of them, some of the parts needed bonification later as, we, as it got years of use. We found we needed some things reinforced like that front fork. Um, and, but it was pretty tough and lots lighter than the imported chairs and had bicycle chair tires front and rear. I apologize, this, the wheels on this were imported. They're, they're stolen off American bicycles and chairs and, and, uh, and I brought them down. Um, but eventually we found out how to make good chairs in Nicaragua as well. They couldn't sell any though because it looked so, so rough. And uh, I mean, hers, hers hadn't even been painted yet, but but even when they were ready to sail, sell, they looked rough. And people dreamed of having the chrome plated models of those days from, from, from up north. Um, but a few months after, this, after they started making these and being unable to sell them, um, their price, by the way, compared to, at that time, $1,000 for a half decent chair in the United States well, half decent, less than half decent, the same one that I had broken down in. Um, this chair sold for about 150 in Nicaragua. Our prices have come down now. Now in real dollars, they're 200, the equivalent of about, of about less than 100 at that time. Um, but a few months after they started making these chairs, some of the, this is right after the Civil War in Nicaragua, well, uh, some of the people riding chairs had been uh, injured in the war. Uh, most of the ones that I knew were sharing chairs, a chair with other people. One person, three, four, three, four people. And some of, the, some of the especially guys wanted to show that they were ready after this, after this war and change of, change of uh, um, change of their society that they were they were they wanted to be included they had become injured in 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 bringing about the change or some in fact were um, fighting for the dictator who had been ousted but still they were Nicaraguans they wanted to participate they wanted to go to school they wanted to get jobs they wanted to raise their families and none of that was open to them at the time so, so one of the things they thought of to do was to hold a marathon clear across Managua, a wheelchair marathon. Um, and so they held it, but the one thing they didn't plan on was that Telma, this woman, entered the race and beat them all. And right after the race, they sold chairs like crazy. Still are. In order to sell chairs, they needed a lot of techniques, but those techniques were available in Nicaragua. Bending hand rims, for example, you want a good straight hand rim that doesn't go up and down or sideways. It's nice and round and flat, and it's made out of, um, in, in English countries, three-quarter inch tubing with a one millimeter or 1.2 millimeter wall, fairly light, mild steel, the cheapest tubing around. Same tubing as this fence in the front of your auditorium. Same thing as restaurant chairs. And same thing as cheap bicycles. Uh, um, so we had, we had some pretty bad hand rims at first. We used various kinds of commercial and otherwise homemade benders. Um, but it was really hard to get a big circle like that perfectly true or close enough to true until we met a blacksmith who was making restaurant tables and they were circular and he was bending very, very nice circles. 
We, 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 saw, we saw one of his tables out in the town and tracked him down. And, and he, um, he, he said, ya no hay problema. Mire, here's a, here was a, a stump outside. He had cut down the tree, cut, filed a groove in the stump, put a big staple in the tree, he would put the end of, of a tubing around that staple, and then just walk around the tree and bend a circle. And it turned out it was just the right size for our chair. Um, he then showed us ways to make other benders like this one that we could fit right in our shop. And, and uh, this one, you, it's just a, it's, quarter inch thick steel bar, inch and a quarter wide, something like that. And you bend, you take a long piece of tubing, you bend it around, you feed it in, you bend again, bend again, bend again. And in a couple of minutes, you can took, turn a 20 foot piece of, six meter piece of tubing into four hand rims, all in a coil. Then you cut them apart. You have scraps at each end, but bending four, at least you've, you've cut your scrap way, way down. And then you bend, cut the, cut the um, scraps into three centimeter slices, slice them up one side, and then squeeze them inside each other. This makes a, uh, a union to go inside the two ends of each hand rim to hold it while you weld it. Then in their case, they were doing it with brass. They didn't have enough electricity to do good welding nor good equipment, but, but oxyacetylene was available. Um, and so they, they just sweat in some brass against that joiner and it makes a very, very strong, same one I have on this chair. That hasn't changed. Here's this, here's this bender being used in Mexico. Um, and uh, again, bend, feed, bend, feed, bend, feed. Um, the fellow Standing up is a, is a house builder in San Francisco who has worked with us now for 20 years doing, um, doing really, really fine quality work. He's a cabinet maker. That's his, that's his uh, livelihood. And here's, here's welding them together. This is with gas and doing it in quantity, just cranking them, cranking them, cranking them out, each one the same so that the chairs can be assembled easily. At, we, we still have some problems with alignment occasionally, and this is how they straighten them out, one of the ways. The other way is putting one by twos under them and jumping on them. Yeah. This is one of the fellows in the Philippines who first showed us a lot of tricks for making fixtures for welding the frames together accurately um, in, um, so, that, so that we could, for example, have a folding frame under the seat that would fold well and would fit into any of our side frames of any size. Um, these folks had been building chairs since the middle 70s, a group of 20 wheelchair riders who had um, had tried to, to reinforce chairs that were like the imported ones and then in, in, uh, made many changes in the chair to make it strong enough. I had worked in the US industry before this time, back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and learned a lot about fixture making, but all of our fixtures in the US were, were based on heavy steel plates or aluminum plates too expensive, um, too hard to handle, just wouldn't happen in, the, in developing countries. But here's one made out of one by two inch rectangular tubing. This is in Mexico, um, and it's on a gimbaled frame, so you can swivel it around and weld different ways. Something we got from the US industry, and works, works very, very well. And these, these uh, fixtures have been gradually, gradually evolving ever since then. Ever since well, ever since the early early '80s, when we when we learned how to do them from the Philippine group, precision is important in order to make every chair the same, so that you don't have to fudge them to fit them together. And and uh, 
AutoCAD then SolidWorks, very helpful. A nice big plotter is nice to have. In San Francisco State, where we went to in the late 80s, had that equipment available. Um, yep, right on target, that, that piece. And this is a Nicaraguan fellow working with a Mexican fellow. We, we, we found ways to get people to travel from shop to shop. Eventually, we had a network of little shops in 40 countries. And everybody teaching everybody else. And, and me, try, me stealing their good ideas and making my chair better. Yeah. Here's a, oh, here's a, here's a sports chair. The one in the foreground, notice the bumper for smashing into other chairs at top speed. Um, basketball, other, other sports. Um, and, that, and sports are one of the best ways to, to kind of break the ice and get people into school and jobs and other, um, other ways to make a living. And, but, but, and, and people are doing sports. Even back in the early 80s, people were beginning to do wheelchair sports all over the world joining into the marathons despite the fact that they would rarely be allowed. They would still, still do it. And, but they never had, at that time, specialized, the specialized equipment that can double your speed, that can, that can make it so you can beat anybody on the basketball or the tennis court or the rugby court, course, the rugby court. And, and uh, one, of the, one of the first widely available third world sports chairs was done by one of your professors here, Kurt Kornbluth, in Zambia. Um, yeah, here's Kurt <laughs> working away. Um, God knows what he's showing him in his drawing book. <laughs> but, um, and Kurt was, Kurt, Kurt was an example of, of just a different way of working, far more mixed with the community. Um, relaxing and, 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 and picking their brains um, because, in fact, if you, if you want to find the best sources of ideas for anything, the fellow who, the 94-year-old inventor who just patented the successor to the lithium-ion battery, at least he, he hopes it will be, and he should know because he patented the original lithium-ion lithium battery in 1980. Um, he, he, he says, go to the people who need the stuff, and, and they will think, think of more solutions than somebody just coming in and being the, a professional. And everybody needs to work with everybody on problems that are too hard to solve. If they're easy problems, sure, set your timeline and click, 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 out it comes. But, but in the wheelchair field, boy, it's, it's tough. I used to work in aerospace in the 60s. I did a, a nine-year apprenticeship in aerospace. And, and it was very interesting and very challenging and a lot easier than wheelchair design because we knew what the problems were and when we had solved them or not. With wheelchairs, we have all these different user types, all these different terrain types, all these different economic situations in which they must speak fit, all these different arrays of parts to repair them 10 years down the road when the wheelchair factory might be gone and you have to go to the blacksmith and do whatever. Uh, it's, it's a tough set of problems, very, very interesting. Yeah. Most of the shops in the 40 countries where we work um, have, have kids in and around the shops at all times. Makes, makes for some safety challenges. Um, but also, since some of the kids are kids of the people working in the shops, um, we can see who's going to be the next generation of, of bright, bright inventors. Here's another one done by Kurt. Um, this is a kid's chair, little one, 20, 20 inch. Is Kurt here? Ah, that's too bad. That's too bad. He, he can tell better stories than me about some of this stuff. He's gotten into lots of trouble. Um, but this chair has a has a gimbal rocking rear wheel. 
if you tip this chair back, um, the rear wheel goes up, the middle wheel goes down. And that allows you to move the, riddle, the, 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 the big drive wheel all the way forward to the center of gravity. The biggest waste factor in wheelchair propulsion, except maybe for really, really rough ground, is um, when you're on a side slope and on, on sidewalks in the west or in, on the edge of the roads in the rest of the world, um, the weight on the front wheels always pulls the front end of the chair down, downhill. So in order to go in a straight line, what do you do? You have to drag one hand and push only with the other. When I'm going around even town here, every few blocks I need to change sides of the street to wear out the other arm. Make it turn the other way. This chair can be designed so that it has equal amounts, very little weight, on both the front and the rear. So you can cross a, a driveway that crosses the sidewalk, a steep, steep side slope, coast across it, and come out in a straight line on the other side. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's still a chair of the future. Kurt did this ooh, 10, 15, 10, 12 years ago. Um, it doesn't fold, it's expensive, it's heavier, and the interest is, is limited in, in it because people don't read, most people who are choosing chairs, medical people or first time chair buyers, don't really know ab about this downhill turning issue and how, how critical it is to, to getting around outdoors. But that's, I hope that's a chair of the future, yeah. Lots of kids in our, shop, our shops have kind of grown up on spoking wheels, welding, bending after school. In the process, become way far ahead of their fellow students in mathematics and, and geometry. Here are some of the, here's, a, here's one of the kids. This fellow is 15, but he's really the size of, a, of an eight-year-old. He broke his back when he was when he was six or seven, and uh, had not been allowed in school at all. Every year, his mother would take him to school and and fight with with the principal and just be pushed away. Uh, at this time, he was going back to school with Panina Mutinda, one of who has become one of Kenya's leading disability rights advocates. She went and faced down that principal, told him that he was violating the, she read the list of regulations under the Americans with Disabilities Act and claimed that they were no Kenyan law. Um, and the kid got into school. He had left school in second grade, something like that, and, and, and within a year he, 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 had, he was up to high school. He just click, click, click through the, through the different grades. And he's doing quite well now. Um, since then, of course, other countries, um, including next door Uganda and South Africa, have passed new laws that go way beyond our Americans with Disabilities Act. In Uganda, people with disabilities are guaranteed representation in their legislature. There are certain, there are certain and, and at every stage of government down to the township, there are slots reserved for people representing others with disabilities, people with disabilities and representing others with disabilities. And not only one in, at each level of government, but one man and one woman, because the women who are the, the leaders of the disability rights movement in Uganda know that they can't trust men 